morning, everybody. As you heard, I'm Dr. Catherine Smart, and I'm the president of the Canadian Medical Association. At our organization, we bring physicians together in the pursuit of better health and a better healthcare system. I've had the opportunity to spend the last day with all of you learning about your world, and I'm excited now to have a bit of an opportunity to bring you into mine. I imagine most of you, when you think back to your childhood, can imagine some time spent playing doctor. I suspect most of your early patients were your siblings. You maybe convinced them to come onto your bed, lie down, treat them as your patient. You might remember performing a physical exam, looking in their ears and throat, listening to their heart and lungs, maybe feeling their stomach, all with the same goal that we in medicine still have today, to make an accurate diagnosis and get your patient on the road to health. I've been very fortunate to actually live out that childhood fantasy, and I now work as a pediatrician in the Yukon, which is one of Canada's northern territories. In that role, I care for children in remote communities uh, throughout the territory, and it's been very rewarding. You can also imagine it has some very interesting and sort of fascinating aspects, like middle of the night medivacs to the Arctic to save a life, sometimes taking a plane to work, um, and other times avoiding roaming wolf packs as I make my way to the health center in an Arctic community. And I don't know if any of you are of the generation to have perhaps watched Grey's Anatomy, but yes, some of that is also accurate. So it may uh, surprise you to know that medicine still looks like this. This is a fax machine. Now, in this room of people, I imagine it's not something you encounter every day. And in fact, looking at the age of some people, you perhaps have never even seen a fax machine or may consider it a historical relic. But in medicine, it is still our major mode of communication. It's how we receive information about our patients from hospitals. It's about how we share information uh, with other physicians. It's how we send prescriptions to, ho or to the pharmacy so that you can get your prescription when you need it. Medicine is anything but interoperable. Think about your personal health data. Where it lives depends more on the building you're in than anything else. There's different systems in hospitals, in a private doctor's office, or perhaps when you go to see a, a counselor or a physiotherapist. None of them speak to each other. It's a lot like the frustration you feel when you have an iPhone device and an Android and they need different plugs and you think, oh my goodness, this is so frustrating. Well, in healthcare, it's sort of like that times 10. So, oh, I'm not quite ready for that one. Okay, so in this context, I think it's important that we think about the healthcare system. Right now, our healthcare system is really sort of feels like it's running on a floppy disk from a Commodore 64 computer. Right now, you know, you bring COVID into the equation, and it was like running a cryptocurrency scheme on that same Commodore 64. <laughs> Felt a bit impossible at times. But COVID has also brought with it one of the biggest transformations in healthcare delivery that we have seen in modern times. Almost overnight, our nation pivoted to virtual care because we had to. And I think it was a reminder that when things need to change in healthcare, they can. The irony of that is I don't need to, I'm sure, tell all of you, is that we had had the technology for virtual care really since the 1970s, but it took a pandemic for us to turn that switch on. And right now, I think where we are is we're figuring out how can we leverage virtual care to improve access to care to our patients and to really make it an immersive experience. Stats are still telling us that most of virtual care right now involves a phone call. Occasionally, it involves telehealth or using a platform like Zoom where we can see each other, but we still are not really seeing technology leveraged as it could be, you know, wearable devices that give me as the physician your vital signs or information about your physical exam. And I think that's the future, to really be able to create those immersive experiences so that we can provide high quality of care in that virtual world, in patients' homes. So much like virtual care has started to change the landscape of healthcare, so has social media changed the landscape of information. I think all of us realize that nowadays, most people are actually getting their information from social media. That can be news, it can be information about health, and even their own health metrics they might be tracking on these platforms. This has created really a fertile ground for the spread of misinformation. We know that in Canada, 35% of people are getting their news from Facebook. Only 5% of our population is reading the Globe and Mail, which is one of our national newspapers. 
So with this situation, it is really concerning because that misinformation is spreading when people are anxious and worried at levels that they never have been before. So what's the result of all this? What we're seeing is a loss of trust in experts. We're seeing increasing polarization in our communities. We're seeing that misinformation environment really burgeoning and spreading. And we're seeing a rise of the celebrity and wellness guru influential culture, which promotes the multi-billion dollar supplement and alternative medicine industry. And often these things are countering established science and taking huge resources from patients for little benefit. We're also seeing at times the shameless promotion of misinformation that leads directly to poor outcomes. And we've seen that during COVID-19 with some people refusing to be vaccinated. We're seeing poor uptake of the COVID vaccine in children. And we've even seen people go as far as to take a drug used to treat a horse parasite, hoping that it might treat their COVID. So, you know, these repercussions are, are real and that belief in anti-science rhetoric is having an impact on our communities. This word cloud is from Twitter, and it's from the past year, and it shows you the, the words that got the most attention when people were tweeting around health. And what you can see is the more dramatic the language, the more polarizing, the more activating the language, the more engagement. And what we've seen is that people that use this type of language and speak in these types of terms often gain hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, or in some case, millions of followers. And at times, we've even seen the dialogue between scientists become something that might resemble a shouting match in a high school playground. So what I like to say is, in the world of science, Twitter is where nuance goes to die. So as physicians, what do we make of this evolving landscape? How does it change the things that we need to be thinking about? Medicine has always been about a doctor and patient relationship. And usually that relationship is a one-to-one -one ratio. But social media is really changing that. I think as physicians, we need to be thinking more broadly about what our relationship with our patients can be and how we can serve more people. Because on social media, we have that opportunity to reach hundreds and thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of people at the same time. And this is happening at a time when many people are struggling to access their own physician, making it all that much more important. The pandemic has really been a catalyst for both healthcare disruption and it has drove mistrust of experts and physicians to a level that we have never really seen before. Recent polling that came out just a couple of weeks in Canada was, I thought, quite shocking. It showed that one in five Canadians believed that the COVID vaccine had killed thousands of people and that this had been covered up. Another one in four Canadians felt that that statement was possibly true. Even more concerning was one in four Canadians believe that the COVID vaccine may contain a microchip to control their behavior. For you tech people, you probably realize that is not very plausible. Um, but what's interesting about that to me is I think at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought some of these beliefs were fringe beliefs. It started as a small group of people, and I don't think we fully understood that the impact of these beliefs and the spread of misinformation might have. It's now at a scale where literally a quarter of our population either believes or thinks it's possible that these things are true. And the World Health Organization has said that this parallel infodemic has been as much of a threat to our health as the pandemic itself. The other thing I think that's interesting about this is, is the real tangible impacts of this misinformation, and we're seeing that in my field of pediatrics. In Canada, one in four children has fallen behind on their routine vaccinations over the past two years. In 2020, 22 million infants did not receive their first measles vaccine. That is the biggest regression in routine childhood vaccinations than we have seen in 20 years. We are now starting to see the reemergence of diseases like polio that had been eradicated in most places of the world. And even just this morning on Twitter, I saw that they had found polio in the wastewater in the UK, and they're advising families to ensure that their children are up to date on their childhood vaccines. So the bottom line is these threats are real, and they are coming for us if we don't take this seriously. I think we all know that societal shifts have been common after and during a pandemic, we've seen major shifts in politics and culture happen after something like COVID-19. 
And I think what we're seeing right now is that COVID-19 has really put this misinformation movement on steroids, particularly when it comes to health. There's also sometimes some positive things that come from these shifts, and what we saw during the Spanish flu was some real evolution in our thinking around public health and also some changes in diagnostics that continue to inform how we practice medicine today. But what's interesting, I think, right now with the burgeoning misinformation is also the context in our healthcare system in which it's occurring. Right now in Canada, one in five Canadians do not have access to a family doctor or a longitudinal relationship with a physician. This has always been the basis of a trusted relationship and a source for reliable information about health and science for our population. And right now, for one in five people, it's not there for them. This is also happening against the background of our healthcare system that's really struggling right now, and, and some of us have even gone to say we feel it's starting to collapse. We've got underwhelming electronic medical records that have dramatically increased the administrative burden for physicians in terms of doing our work. We have very poor data architecture and ability to either use data to drive accountability or outcomes in our system or to share information. We've got growing backlogs, especially for things like surgery and diagnostic imaging across our system. Wait times are at an all-time high, and there is an epidemic of bur uh, burnout amongst physicians and other healthcare professionals that is driving attrition and an exodus from primary care. So this is, again, creating a really dangerous environment in which misinformation can spread. As the population becomes more distanced from their healthcare professionals and science, there's more space for anti-science to fill that void. I think all of us, or many of us, if those of you are involved in healthcare would know that I don't think our industry has a great reputation for disruption or innovation at scale. Uh, I think as physicians, we really need to start to challenge our thinking around healthcare and how it's delivered and even how our system is put together. And we have to be willing to change that status quo and sometimes have difficult and even provocative conversations about what is needed to get our healthcare system where it needs to be and to really provide people with the quality and access to care that they deserve. As Einstein said, we're never gonna solve problems using the same thinking that created them in the first place. So I think as physicians, we can't be afraid to embrace that role and think about what we can do to move things forward. Could there be a dramatically different role for physicians, and could that be one of the legacies of COVID-19? So what might a post-pandemic physician look like? Perhaps an information disruptor, a partner that designs tools with folks like yourselves who actually know how to make technology work, things that could be interoperable, intuitive EMRs supported by artificial intelligence, accessible to patients, health data available in real time to drive decision making, to support lifestyle interventions, and to allow people to access all of that in a virtual hub where their health data lived and they could be in there with their care providers making sure that their needs were met. Another role I could see as a misinformation warrior, an expert and master communicator around health battling misinformation and ensuring that our communities have the information they need to make good health decisions moving forward. But to do this, we're going to need new skills, different skills than we've maybe traditionally had as physicians. We are going to need to be expert communicators and content creators. Our medical schools are gonna to need to evolve to bring these new skill sets into how we're trained, and we're going to need all of you to work with us as well in combating misinformation looking out for facts and supporting us as we develop these new skills. At the CMA, I've been very fortunate to serve this year as president and take a deep dive into our healthcare system, while at the same time engaging in both traditional and social media to try to spread good information, counter misinformation, and demystify health for the public. I know that we have a lot of work ahead of us, but I believe by reimagining ourselves as physicians, we can meet this moment. Healthcare is ripe for discussion, and we need to decide the role as physicians we want to play in that disruption. I think we have a huge opportunity to reimagine ourselves and our role and to catalyze a serious change in health and healthcare. Thank you.